Hi everybody, my name is Stavros Xanthopoulos, I am from Brazil, from Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Getúlio Vargas Foundation in Rio de Janeiro. I'm very happy to be here in the OCW global community and certainly the OER community all over the world. I'm very happy to be presenting to you tonight in the afternoon and in the morning all over the world the, our case, the FGV case of OCW, and speak a little bit of a very, very great victory we had in our country due to a colleague of mine, Carolina Rossini, in the state of Sao Paulo, where we have just had a law, an act published that we have OERs in the state of Sao Paulo. So before we do that, I'm going to show you a little bit of what we do here at FGV Online, which is the branch or the program of distance education of Getulio Vargas Foundation. Okay? So our mission is basically to develop and manage technologies, methodologies, and specific distance educational solutions under the academic responsibility of FGVs, schools and institutes. Let me explain that a little bit. Our foundation basically has schools of business administration, economics, law, social sciences, math, and under these schools and some research institutes, we have a long distance or distance education program which we develop these methodologies both nationally and internationally leading and innovating in quality educational services. So that is our mission. Our vision is to be an internationally reference in the distribution of high quality and innovative products and services in distance education. So that's basically what we try to do on both sides. Foca aqui um pouquinho. Uh, some of the seals that we have actually managed to, to get it through and to be part of. We are the only Brazilian institution besides the Association of Distance Education that are part of the ICDE the International Council of Open and Distance Education. We are a supporting member of the OCW, and we have became a full member since November 2008, and we started off in July 2008 in a partnership with U University of uh, California at Irvine. Uh, we are part of the Brazilian Association of Distance Education, of which I am the vice president the Vice President currently. These two seals, they are national seals where we are top of mind in the corporate solutions for distance education programs and we are in the top 10 ranked solutions for HR solutions in terms of distance education solutions in the market ranked for the 500 top enterprises in the country. Okay, besides that, both our executive MBA programs and our undergrad courses are both cell accredited by the EFMD, which is the European Foundation for Management Development uh, seal. In the OCW People's Choice Award, we were awarded as the most inno innovative and avant-garde institution in 2011, and last year we were granted the uh, most uh, engaging resource also uh, seal in the People's Choice Award. So that's a little bit of what we represent as our program. As I said, uh, FTV Online is part of an institute of basically developing solutions where the schools orbit around us and we attend private and state companies, executives and entrepreneurs. We deal with corporate universities. 
we deal with non-graduates, undergraduates, and postgraduate students. So that's the scope of what we do, okay? The solutions and competencies that we have developed. Uh, we work with courses via satellite. This, stu this studio where we are transmitting now is our studio. We can see we transmit through the studio. We have live transmissions. This is where we do some of the work on our TV programs, and we also have live transmissions. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, okay? We have web-based courses and training programs. We have distance and blended MBAs. I put MEC. MEC is the Ministry of Education of our country. These courses have been uh, certified, and they are we have to have the authorization of our ministry to be able to deploy these courses since 2003, okay? We have corporate television, we use e-learning tools, we have technological undergrad courses, we do have distance education research groups, we do extension, updating and improvement courses, corporate courses and training programs, we manage corporate universities, we develop virtual report databases, we develop curriculum or curriculi, and we do blended courses and training programs, okay? All these things are managed by appropriate language and instructional design, online evaluation tools, multimedia instructional materials. We have specialized tutorship, this is one of our advantages. Specific academic projects, we do run a virtual library, we have technical and academic support. We have developed a community of practice, and we also have a very, very attractive collaborative environment. So that's basically the solutions and the competencies that we have developed under our flag, FGV Online. The human capital that is involved in our uh, organization. Last year, we dealt with over 55,000 students which enrolled and were paying students. I'm not taking into account here what would be the students that did all the free online OCW courses. These are the students that enrolled on our paying courses. Both open enrollment and with what we call the corporate solutions or the corporate courses, okay? The FGV school faculty staff are basically the, the the professors and the lecturers that are the authors of our courses. We have around 480 teachers there. We also have executive faculty that support our courses. And these, these, these people normally follow up our courses in the classrooms, especially on the satellite programs, and sometimes on the face-to-face -face encounters that we have in the evaluation encounters that we are obliged to have because of the Ministry of Education, and they develop extracurricular activities in these encounters. So we have around 900 teachers that do that. And we also have a dedicated uh, team of around 220 employees and 12 educational project managers. So we have around 232 people that work directly uh, developing all our materials, contents, and all the logistics and the operations that we have in terms of marketing, sales, uh, operations management, uh, tutorship, production, web design, and so forth. We also have tutors, over 1,200 experts in the, in the course fields of knowledge that uh, we do in distance education. 9% of these guys have doctorate degrees, 55% are master's degrees, and 36% are specialists, okay? Uh, the infrastructure. Classrooms and satellite TV equipment available in more than 80 cities in our country. We have uh, partners all over our country. Brazil is a very, very big country, as you guys know. We have probably the fourth, we are the fourth largest country in terms of continuous land, okay, and probably the fifth largest country as a whole. So we have partners all over the country. So we have satellite and TV equipment over, in more than 80 cities. We have over 450 online modular subjects developed. 
These subjects are uh, around 30 hour modular subjects, so that's a lot of stuff. We have 60 corporate TV programs developed and 60 business cases, all on video. Uh, 48 business simulators developed. All these business simulators, with the exception of three, which are those classical business simulators, are all serious games based, okay? And uh, this infrastructure, the tools of course delivery, we work with Moodle and Blackboard. We have a satellite channel TV. We do webcasting, which is what we're going through now, the tool we're using now, video conferencing. We have web 2.0 tools, and we have our own community of practice. The fields of knowledge which we deploy. The foundation works with law, economics, education and communication, ethics and history, environmental, marketing, people, production, project, business, finance and public management. So these are the basic fields of knowledge that where we develop our content. Well, I hope everybody is following and I'm not going too fast. I hope the noise that we're generating here is not reaching you people, okay? It happens on live transmissions, okay? Good. Okay. I could speak in Portuguese, Afrikaans, Greek also, but I'm going to speak in English. Good. Our products. Extension courses. Short duration. Basically, we have 15 to 30 hour subjects. Over here, we offer, we have offers that range every one and a half to two months, and we offer around 80 to 100 courses to a public in general. Medium duration courses, 90 to 180 hours. Sorry, these courses deploy in around nine weeks. They are all tutored courses, right? People don't take exams. We always, we just deploy uh, certificates according to activities that are followed. And uh, they just uh, get a printed uh, certificate if they do the activities. The medium duration courses, they, they have a duration of about four months, okay? And over here we have around uh, 20 or 30 of these that are offered. Undergraduation courses is a long duration, 1,800 hour courses. And over here, we offer seven different courses. We have a general manager, management course, finance, public administration, services, marketing, uh, tourism, and there's one missing. I don't remember now. Don't remember. If I remember, I'll tell you later. And then cust uh, uh, graduation courses, long duration, over 360. And these are clock hours, okay? which uh, here we're talking about executive MBAs. So basically, we're talking about businesses with some majors. So we have regularly marketing, finance, human resources, and all of those environmental operations management and so forth, okay? And customized educational solutions on demand. And there we cover courses, corporate college solutions, corporate TV, and satellite solutions also. Uh, satellite solutions are very important in our country still because uh, we still have problems with lighting the country in terms of internet. So satellite is still something used widely in Brazil. Okay? Our assumptions. The knowledge is generated by FGV schools. We have nine schools. Out of nine schools in the country, Five of our schools are ranked between the top schools in the country, three of which are in the top five positions. So we are a very prestigious organization. Our organization is considered as one of the most important think tanks in Latin America and in the Southern Hemisphere. And we are, con we, we are ranked among the top 30 think tanks in the world in terms of uh, public policy thinking. So uh, we are very much based on the knowledge generated by our schools. 
We curricula our curriculum is focused on the Brazilian context. Mastery and use of new technologies. We are focused on this all the time. We worry about research and the three main vectors that we use in terms of being sustainable is we focus on what the objectives of learning are. The, we focus on the public that needs the, these objectives and we see what technology is needed so it's going to make that sustainable. So we just don't go about applying technology without seeing how sustainable it is in terms of reaching the learning objectives. So we do not design any course without taking into account these three issues. What is the target public? What are the learning objectives? And how is technology going to be applied so we reach this in a sustainable manner? Okay, so we always look at these two issues, cost reduction and higher efficiency. The collaborative environment using tools that are, that are synchronous for real-time meetings and asynchronous in order to allow flexible participation. Okay, and permanent access to the virtual library to our students. So th these are the main assumptions that we take into account to design our educational solutions. The functions that we have developed and adapted in our Moodle over here, right? The study environment, virtual library, virtual classrooms, calendar. Calendar is very important. Uh, we, we think, uh, we, we, t we invest a lot of time to teach our student to become a distant educational student, right? It's very important in the context nowadays to get the student to become a, distant, a distance educational learner. All right? It's not going to help him in the course only. It's going to give him the drive for him to take these tools to his everyday life, not only professionally, but in his personal life and his professional life because the tools that we use on our everyday courses on his daily basis of study, he's going to use in his profession, in his everyday life, to be competitive, OK? Our best practices can be pointed out as our collaborative environment, the synchronous tools for real-time meeting, the asynchronous tools to make follow-up and guidance to students to be more flexible. We are now beginning to analyze big data on our logs of all the tutorship that we do. So we're trying to follow up people using artificial intelligence models. It's a new project that we're setting up. This is probably <clears throat> one of the most interesting issues that we, or one of the most interesting uh, aspects that we bring into the success factors of what we do is the specialized tutors in the curriculum uh, which are fully qualified for distance education. Uh, you don't only have to be prepared as a teacher or a lecturer or a professor. You have to know how to be a distance educational tutor. So we prepare the professor, the teacher or the lecturer to really know how to surf in the virtual environment, how to motivate the student in the environment, how to really show him that he has to stick into the course. So that is the most critical factor because obviously the content has to be attractive. The student has to stick to the content and that's easy to guarantee because if you really know how to have a very interesting instructional design, you can actually reach that. Okay, if you have the right technology, you can keep the content up. But what really guarantees that the student will be there is a tutor that will make him feel that somebody's there for him. And that's probably the key factor that makes our student not give up the course. Our attrition rates are probably 20% of what the average rates are in most 
of the courses in our country and in international rates that we observe. And that probably is because the tutor is very active. I'll give you an example. If a student of ours does not study regularly, the tutor will actually uh, tell our technical support that the student isn't going into his virtual classroom. And he will actually be called by the technical support and will be asked, why isn't he going to class? So the student really feels that there is somebody there for him. Okay? So this is probably one of the best practices that makes the difference. Because he feels as if there's somebody there for him. Okay? So this is a moment of truth, which is probably the most important aspect of making the difference of how we treat the student in terms that makes uh, this a key factor uh, of success for our courses. The technical support, the continuous follow-up of user's access, and quality control, which we do uh, specifically for this. So that's very quickly. I hope I haven't bored you with this and hope I've transferred something, some of the values and some of the practices of what we do and what we believe in and obviously all the things that uh, certainly are used by uh, some of you guys and, and if you don't use them, I hope you can use them uh, from then on. This is just an example of what happens from this studio. We, we have a dedicated satellite TV channel, so we transmit uh, to over 150 classrooms, for example, live to 62 cities covering 19 of the 27 states in the country. We have over 5,000 students uh, watching us live, and in each classroom we have another lecturer following up on the students who deploys cases and then we come back and we throw concepts back and they discuss this and it comes back and so forth. So that's examples of different types of semi-presential courses that we have besides the e-learning and other blended stuff that we do. Okay, the corporate TV where we have courses broadcasted via satellite and virtual classrooms that can support the, the, the courses. We develop over 60 courses every year, okay? We also have on demand schedule, okay? The competitive advantage here is that every course that brings in concepts is supported by a business case that brings in the context. And these business cases are all businesses set up in the country. They might be international uh, businesses, so uh, a teacher or a professor from our school brings in the concepts which are supported by a context of a business, okay? So that, that's the, the, the big uh, aspect that comes in as a differential in our corporate TV. This is just a summary of the awards I told you each year that have come up, okay? And all the certifications that we have, actually the cell accreditation in terms of the executive MBA, we got with honors, the top of mind, the best 10 uh, suppliers or, or vendors of solutions, and we've actually been repeatedly getting these things, and I hope we can still follow up on the rest. The social responsibility, we have partnerships with the National Museum where we uh, work with indigenous schools. We developed three courses for indigenous schools in the country. We worked with, uh, we've developed two courses for accessibility, one course for uh, intellectual property and development targeted for residents in developing country. We have scholarships for merit and social inclusion and free tuition courses, which I'm gonna talk about now, where I'm gonna develop just a little bit of talking, no more slides, where we have reached 48 courses delivered through the OCW Consortium. Five of them now, which are gonna be launched in Spanish, okay? We have had over 16 million visitors since its launching, and over 3.5 million have already taken free tuition courses we can guarantee that, at least, that they have begun and finished the course 
at least because they have registered, and I'll speak a little bit about that from now on, okay? So I'm just gonna take a sip of water, and I'm gonna sit down a little bit and talk with you guys now. Good. So now we're gonna just chat a little bit, do a little bit of storytelling. No more slides. Coloquem a primeira, por favor. Primeira transparência. Aquela que tem o símbolo da escola. Isso. Good. Well, July 2008. We started off OCW motivated by our partner, University of California, Irvine, where my colleague, Gary Matkin, where we have a partnership in our executive MBA. And, uh, you know, very many of my colleagues at uh, the foundation were reluctant when I proposed. And they said, well, free courses, how's that? I said, well, it's going to be fine. You know, many people were going to have access to courses. People who would never have the chance to have access to our materials, you know, good content, high quality stuff. It's going to be nice. Oh, well, let's try it first. So Gary and I agreed to go on this, you know, journey. So Gary offered that we went on a partnership on his registration in OCW. So what we did was, uh, we translated one of his courses, which was a human resource management course, into Portuguese. And we didn't only translate it. We actually um, remodeled the course into a language which was something uh, more tropical, more Brazilian, more something used to, to, to what we used to, yeah, in terms of an interface. And we introduced uh, a course that was uh, written by one of my professors, Professor Elizabeth Silveira, which is Ethics in the Organization. So we started off by these two very short courses, plain e-learning courses, where people could just go through quickly, maximum five to eight hours. And we just launched that through the, the OCW of our University of California, Irvine, site. And what happened was that in 10 days we got something like 20,000 hits. No publicity, nothing. And uh, all of a sudden, three weeks later, we had something like 70,000 hits. And the, the IT people at UC Irvine were starting to get worried because they, they, they got hits which they were not used to getting at that time and they started getting floods in terms of people getting into their sites. And all of a sudden we start getting a lot of publicity here in my country and all of a sudden we saw there was a new phenomenon. People started to click on the free courses frequently. So we got free publicity here and in the States. Well, time went by, and by November, we decided that we wanted to become full members of OCW. And in November 2008, we became full members, when obviously uh, there were some obligations that we had to publish a certain number of courses in the first 24 months or something. And by November, we had published two more courses. So we had four courses up by then. And by the end of that year, we had had something like 300,000 hits. And that's how it went. And then a new thing happened. I, I started getting emails from people who accessed and they wanted certificates. Certificates. You know, uh, I don't know 
how many people are watching us and where you guys are, but I know, and I know that all the Brazilians that are watching me know that we Brazilians like to put up papers on the wall, yeah? Certificates on the wall. So everybody said, how do I certify what I do here? And uh, my question was, how do I certify something which I cannot control, that I cannot follow? Right, so I got tons of emails. How do I certify this? And on the other hand, I also got emails saying, wow, the course, the course I did on human resources, the course I did on this helped me out uh, keep my job, I got a better job, uh, my team did the course on IT and we improved our job, etc. So it was very, very nice to see how these courses were helping people. And, on, and uh, we thought a little bit and the idea that we had was this. If you want uh, some way of getting something which is really informal, and you want to formalize it, the only way we could do that would be, then you, you're gonna register, which means you're gonna tell me exactly who you are, so you're gonna give me uh, the number of your document, your name, your address, and all your data, and you're gonna go through the course. All the courses were either um, a summary of one of our courses, paid courses, of course, or a module of one of these courses. So these were exactly the same courses that we offered on our portfolio of the paid courses, right? So the people would actually uh, register, they would go through the course, each part of the modules, or the module itself, would have activities. And if you went through these activities, or the tests, or whatever the course brought, as part of the activities, and if they got a grade, which would be seven or higher out of 10, then they would have the right to print out a declaration of participation. So that actually was the way we found to get rid of the hundreds of emails we got every week where people asked for certificates. So in the beginning it was fine, excellent. But then we had an idea. So if people register to get a certificate, sorry, to get a declaration that they went through the course, why not take advantage of that and uh, try and understand who are these users? Yeah? So that was <coughs> The second step, so we started saying, okay, so if you register, I don't know when you're gonna take the course, or you can do that in a month, in a day, in some hours, it doesn't matter. You're there, you're registered, you're going through the course. When you come to the end and you're entitled to print out your declaration, before you do that, you, you're gonna exchange something for the declaration now. You're gonna tell me not only who you are, where you live, etc., but if you had done this before, why did you do it? If your expectations were met, how you found out about this? Did you like the method? Would you actually tell somebody about this? What's your age group? what's your education, what's your profession, and so forth. So we actually started getting data about the users. And this actually helped us see the profile of who were the people taking our courses. And it gave us very, very useful information of what the profile of the people who are, were using these OERs, or, the, or actually the, the, the free courses that obviously were Creative Commons licensed and so forth, okay? And we found out the uses. And obviously, uh, 
this has been a very interesting database. And that's how the story developed. And the numbers are interesting. And, uh, and besides the numbers, there, there are some very, very interesting stories that can be said about how they've been used. I, I can, uh, besides the, the numbers I told you up there, uh, I can tell you that since we became a member, July, since we started in July 2008, as I told you, we've published 43 courses. We have had more than 16 million visits to the main courses page. Six million people have registered. I don't know, obviously, out of the 16 million people, there might have been people who have gone through a course which have not registered. I don't know. Uh, if, if somebody has registered, if so, sorry, if somebody has not registered and has gone through a course. Uh, there are people who are not worried about uh, formalizing going through a course or not. But we have already printed more than 3.5 million declarations to these people, okay? We have had over 4,000 foreign students from 45 countries. Obviously, these courses being in Portuguese, most of these are Brazilians that dwell in these countries, like USA, Germany, Argentina, Angola, Portugal, and Japan. Uh, most of these, uh, as you see, the number is very small, which shows us that uh, over 99.9% or 99.8% are people from our own country. It's interesting that most students are between uh, 15 and 25 years old, 30%. Obviously, when I say 15 and 25, I'm saying that uh, obviously they are undergrads, but 43% uh, are from 25 to 35 years old, which are people which are already in the graduate age that need some uh, continued education in the sense, not of continued education in the sense that uh, they, they need graduate education already. 50% of these have finished their graduation. 30% occupy analyst positions in their jobs. Administration or business administration is the highest number uh, in terms of students in these open courses which sums up 27% in terms of profession. It's interesting that most of these students have a monthly income of US 1,000. And that would be people that would never be able at this time uh, to afford a, paying a paid course at the foundation. The foundation uh, targets uh, the high end of our society. So we would be an organization as a, as a school, a business school, or in economics, or a law school, compared to, to universities like Harvard, MIT, Stanford, if we're talking about American institutions. So actually, what we are doing is we are making what we might say content, high quality content available to people that would have only open educational content normally available. So the foundation does that now for over 20 years. I say 20 years and some people are gonna say, well, this guy is saying that 
But he said that you guys are at the OCW, OCW since 2008. All right. That is on online courses. Correct. But we have had a network of face-to-face -face executive MBAs all over the country on our partnership network since 1992, where we have had our professors, lecturers, traveling to Brazil every weekend to these cities where I mentioned, where we have networks and we have satellites nowadays and TV and TV classrooms with satellite antennas and TVs since 1992. So the foundation has had premium education with access on face-to-face -face basis in this country since 1992. And we have added online premium education with access through OCW and freely since July 2008. So I remember when I read a report done on a research which was financed by the Secretary of Education of the United States on metadata of uh, publication based on publications in the US by the Secretary of Education in 2009 that said that education in the future would be premium face-to-face -face online access and we had contradicted that by far because we had already had premium and access for some time already we see that that does not work anymore it's, we just have to look at the massive online courses now where we see examples like Coursera and so on showing us that we have premium courses done by hundreds and thousands of people on a freely basis for the time being and we don't know where that's going to go to on a premium free basis for the time being. But when we talk about OERs, I can guarantee you that at least our content, although it is closed on an e-learning learning object, it has a premium high quality level and it is accessed freely and used by people that would never have a chance to have afford a course in the foundation. It is not only accessed by individuals, okay? Uh, before I talk about that, let, just let me speak about other indicators. 99% had their expectations met by the end of the course. All of these people would recommend an online course to friends and family. One of, the, one of the aspects which I find very interesting is that in the beginning, most people found out about the courses through the internet. And around mid-2009, almost end-2009, the word of mouth overtook the internet. So people started indicating the consortium rather than finding it through the internet. That's an interesting phenomenon. Another interesting phenomenon, and that is an alert for the boys. Girls access more than the boys. In the beginning, it was a 60-40 ratio. Now we see a 57-43 ratio. So we're sort of catching up, but we're still behind. So girls, you're taking over. Well done. All right. So these are some of the data that I can bring up to you in terms of how our uh, 
OCW is doing. Besides that, uh, what I can tell you is we do have some bad uses of our OCW, unfortunately. Sometimes we see people offering their products in the internet and telling people, if you buy our product, you can get a free course at FGV. And obviously they direct and, or they redirect their customers to our OCW. You know, and then we have to obviously uh, tell the police about that. But, uh, you know, well, I'm not going to waste time with these things. What we have found lately is that uh, some universities are, for example, using our content as part of their curriculum. So they tell their students, for example, to take our methodology, our research methodology course at the OCW, as part of their curriculum. And then this is part of the content which will be, uh, or it is part of the course, obviously, and it will be part of the tests or the evaluation process in their course. And that makes us very happy, which we know is obviously enhancing a course at the university. We are thinking of enhancing our license with Creative Commons so that we can effectively have people collaborating in our material. It's not simple to do that because it involves some of our policies in the foundation, but I'm working on it. Another thing that we are doing is the mission of our foundation is to develop Brazil. As I told you, we're not only an educational institution, but we are also uh, an institution that has influence in public policy in our country. Otherwise, we will not be ranked as a think tank. But now, we are also, uh, one, part of our mission is also to try and uh, influence the unity of our region. And we are starting to do that through the translation of our courses into Spanish. And we are just launching five of our courses into Spanish. And we are also uh, translating, uh, I don't know if it's seven or eight more courses into Spanish. We're doing that. It's all self-funded. We have no help from government. OK, so that's one of our projects. And last year, we were very, very surprised to have won the People's Choice Award with uh, the most engaging resource, because we just uh, you know we, we ran against uh, um, iTunes U and Khan Academy, so it, you know uh, the result was very surprising because uh, I, when I looked up the results, I, I I wanted to look up and see who I lost to, and not I was very surprised when we won. So uh, the next project we have is we're also going to translate our our learning objects, our courses, to English. So we also want to offer this to the English community and see how our materials react to the English community. How the English, sorry, how the English community reacts to our materials. The Brazilian people, they are very avid. They are very, very keen to good content. We were very surprised to see how people who sometimes go to uh, internet cafes to access content. The people that access OCW sometimes do not, at, the, at least at 2008, 2009, 2010, they used to go to internet cafes to get, to get access to OCW. So we were very happy to see how this was a breakthrough to show people that they really want to learn and how fragile our educational system is in terms of not giving people the real right to education. And thinking about that, this was a very, very motivating factor for the foundation to put up another project. Although we don't work on K-12, or on what we call high school education, we 
developed a full high school content program on the same basis of our contents of FTV Online. So we launched, it's almost uh, complete, a full program on high school content, which has the whole content plus uh, questions that can be simulated for the students to revise the content. And we are building a question bank which will, it's, it has around 7,000 questions already published and we are willing to, to build 50,000 questions which will cover the national exam questions so people can practice the national exam. And this will also be an open educational resource for high school students in the country, for teachers, and for state schools to use freely. And this was all motivated by how keen people who did not have access to good quality materials were when OCW came up. So these factors motivated the president of the foundation through our OCW initiative to put up this project. So this was also self-funded and it is up and going and it, will, it, it is already being used. We showed it to the Ministry of Education. They were, they, they were very surprised by it. And it is another initiative which was based on the success that OCW had, mainly by uh, 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 the, the real excitement that Brazilians have of having certificates. Because if we did not have the declarations, and if we do not understand who were the people that accessed the OCW, we would not know exactly uh, who, who these people were and how keen they were on getting the, 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 the premium content and so forth. So we actually owe the, the high school content to the OCW initiative. So that, you know, that, that's basically our story. So I have about seven minutes, I think, in terms of wrapping up my, my speech here. And I want to speak about the initiative, which is, that was a real, as we say here, goal. Yeah? Goal as an objective, goal as in soccer or football, depending on which country you are in, that my colleague and friend, Carolina Rossini, scored in the state government of Sao Paulo, yeah? which she actually managed to put up, which would be the law in 2011, which is law number 989, uh, which is a policy of open educational resources that the, the public administration, direct public and indirect public administration of the state of Sao Paulo has established, which means that any resource which is developed under the public administration of Sao Paulo will be available in an electronic site or an internet site, okay, in the portal of the government, and it will be licensed to be freely used as far as it, it can be downloaded, distributed, redistributed, as long as you preserve the rights of the author and it cannot be used commercially. This is a real breakthrough, which means that from now on, and, and the, the state representative who wrote the law, which is Simão Pedro, and this was actually sanctioned in 2011, this is a breakthrough because now, if you work in a public university or in a public uh, <coughs> uh, organization in, in, in the state of Sao Paulo and you develop some material, it, it has to be freely available. And it can be collaboratively uh, worked on and it will be available for anybody to actually learn by, uh, through it. And, the, and any knowledge that is gained from that can be used by the citizen who can apply that to something 
which might improve his life and the life of other citizens, and that will improve the country. And if that happens at the federal level or in other states, we're going to have and we're going to move a great step forward to something that our country and any developing country needs. So uh, I think that we went a great step forward here in terms of an initiative which is not like ours, which was just something that we did because we believed in, which is something which is really put up by law. Okay? So I would like to actually congratulate the efforts and the initiative of, of Rossini here, and of course, Simon Pedro and the, and the governor of the state of Sao Paulo. And I hope that th there is a project uh, in, the, in the federal level now, and I hope that they transform that into a law too. And I hope that the Ministry of Education also da takes up its role and goes through that, because what we need is that, is that our citizens have access to knowledge that can transform the country. Because the biggest gap that we have at this moment is the educational gap. Because, you know, the, economical, the economics is at least picking up. You know, our institutional problems have been solved. Our economical problems are set and are being on the right track. And the biggest gap that we have is the qualification gap, and that has to be done through education. And open educational resources may, might be one of the issues that will probably go through that. And I agree that maybe the technological issue and the online education will be one of the key elements that might help through there. Well, maybe I'll stick to that. I just want to put, oh, let me go to the, to the end of this maybe quickly. I think I have the last slide. Put it up here. You now professors, lecturers, teachers, we can go on for hours. You only gave me one hour. So that's it. Thank you very much for keeping up with me. I hope you're not sleeping, okay? It was fun for me. I hope you had a good time. Thank you very much. Nowadays, I'm the vice dean of all the educational programs at Fundação Getúlio Vargas, and I'm still responsible for all the online programs, okay? This is my email address, and this is our site. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye bye. This is a global bye bye to all the online educational community, all the OER community, all the OCW community, and I'm involved on OER research for the Southern Hemisphere. Okay? Bye bye then.